Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. My name is Laura Salvatore, and I'm the Public Programs Coordinator here. I'm excited to welcome you here for tonight's program, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, A Life, with author Jane Sharon DeHart in conversation with Alice Kessler Harris. We're very excited. Um, today is the release of the book, so you're getting the first glimpse. The Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust, is the primary resource for teaching about the Holocaust in the Northeastern United States, as well as the third largest Holocaust museum in the world. We are excited to offer a robust season of programming, including next Monday, October 22nd, when we will screen animated short films from the series The Pod Caminers, which will be followed by a conversation with filmmaker Sarah Camris, who will explore her own family's history and the process of making these films. We hope to see you next Monday and throughout the rest of the season. More information about this and all of our programs can be found at the front desk and on our website as well. Tonight's conversation is moderated by Alice Kessler Harris. Alice is the R. Gordon Hoxie Professor Emerita of American History at Columbia University. Author Jane Sharon DeHart is a Professor Emerita of History at the University of California, Santa Barbara, which is where she lives as well. Thank you all for being here tonight, and without further ado, I'll turn it over to Alice. Okay, is that better? Yeah. Good. I'll say it again, <laughs> because it is indeed a very pleasant task to be asking Jane questions tonight about her new book, which I am about to wave out to you. This is the book. It is heavy, but it's worth it, every page of it. <laughs> and you don't have to read the, pad, the last 100 pages, because that's back matter. <laughs> well, but some of the footnotes are actually Quite interesting. interesting, quite interesting. But I, I want to say that it's a special pleasure for me to be doing this, not only because I've known Jane for many years and for most of the years during which she was working on this book, but also because Ruth Bader Ginsburg has achieved at this moment something of the stature to which I think she always aspired and that she fully and completely deserves. So some of you may have seen the film, The Notorious RBG. I've actually seen that film. And I can tell you that if you've seen the film, you should buy the book because the story in the book is fuller and more complete in every way than the film. Uh, and now I'm going to start by asking Jane some questions. I'm going to play Charlie Rose. Or I think that's a dirty word these days, but <laughs> <laughs> I'll play well, whatever the equivalent is. Is there an equivalent? And uh, we'll ask Jane some questions. I'll take over for the first half hour or so, and then we'll open the floor, and you can ask questions too. Uh, so Jane... Let me first congratulate you on the book and on its publication and start by asking you why. <laughs> why well, Ruth Bader Ginsburg? What was it that drew you to her? Well, I had, as you well know, I had written a book previously about the twin efforts in the 1960s on the part of feminists to get discrimination discrimination against women uh, unconstitutional. And I had done the first study, which was a grassroots study. And I naively thought I didn't have to go to law school <laughs> to write the second. I did, in fact, uh, have to learn a great deal about law. And I was very lucky because I had friends who were legal scholars who helped me out. Um, but I, I didn't start. I didn't start to write a biography. I was interested in her 
litigation uh, in the 1970s for the ACLU. And I went to the Manuscripts Library at Princeton, which is the repository for ACLU papers, and asked if I could see the papers of the Women's Rights Project after they had the first case, Read v. Read, and I read the case files, and I was absolutely blown away. Mm. And they said, well, we're very sorry. We don't have them. Um, and I looked at them very strangely, and they said, we know we don't have them because the FBI wanted to see them when she was named to the court. Um, so after a lot of frustration and, and telephone calls with the national office of the ACLU, of which insisted that they didn't have the papers, a colleague of mine said, well, why don't you write to Justice Ginsburg and see if she can help you locate the papers, which I did. And um, it turned out they had been lost in a, a move between offices of the, the national headquarters of the ACLU. And she said, well, you know what? I have at the Supreme Court in the storage closet, my files from the time. Well, if you know anything about, uh, and she said you can have access to them. And if you know anything about Ginsburg, she is incredibly precise. Mm. And the file, I thought, oh boy, using unused, you know, unarchived uh, files is going to be a problem, but it wasn't at all. Wonderful. So then you were hooked. <laughs> I, was, were. I was hooked, and I was particularly hooked after I started reading about the cases. Right. And uh, um, I met her for the first time at a, a, a Supreme Court Historical Society meeting in which John Hope Franklin mm -hmm. was speaking. John Hope Franklin is a well-known historian, African-American, probably the father of African-American American history, history in the U.S. And um, I was told that she usually came to these meetings and that I could meet her if, if the Ginsburgs came. And so I raced across with the, the person who was going to introduce me at the end and met her and said, thank you so much. But she was talking with Justice Souter. So I backed off and went into the room where they were serving refreshments and had my plate, which I was filling up. And there was a little tug on my sleeve. And I looked around, and there she was. And uh, I said, I just had the best time reading the correspondence between you as dearest D'Amica and Ranger Fred, uh, who was the, the local uh, attorney in a case. And, she, and her eyes lit up, and she started talking about the case. And then, of course, someone came along, and uh, the conversation ended. Right. And a little later, uh, she came up again, and um, mm. the conversation ended when someone came up to talk to her. So, Jane, tell us something about what she was like as a person. I mean, you interviewed her half a dozen times, or you were in conversation with her. Your, the first uh, chapter of the book is filled with wonderful comments and insights about her childhood and her relationship with her mother. Can you just talk a little bit about what she's like as a human being? Well, this, this is a particularly interesting question because she had said, uh, when we left that night, she said, now, if you have any questions, just ask me. And as long as, and I would have an interview with her on 
Friday evening of Labor Day weekend. And as long as I ask about ACLU, the litigation, she was very helpful. But I made an almost fatal mistake one time because we were talking on the telephone to set the date. And I said, I'd like to talk about Flatbush next time. She said, we don't need to talk about Flatbush. And I said, well, you know, uh, she had asked me to call her Ruth. And I said, well, you know, Ruth, there, in the articles I've read, uh, there are contradictory facts. And I think it's very important to get the record straight. And she said, I'll give you half an hour. Now, this was really unusual because when we were talking about the ACLU litigation, uh, we would make an appointment at 4 o'clock on Labor Day weekend, and sometimes I left the, her chambers at 7 o'clock. But I thought I'll take whatever I can get. And she said, half an hour. And I thought to myself, I'm flying from California to Washington on my own dime for half an hour, but I said, of course, I'll be happy to come. So, and so we worked out, uh, we worked out a, a process uh, for the first chapter where I said, I mean, she clearly were things she was not eager to talk about. And I said, well, why don't I write up my notes and send them to you, and then you can make any corrections as a fact that you need to. But it took me years to get the information for the first chapter. Mm -hmm. After that, it was much easier. It is an amazing chapter, which, which sort of in, in, it explores the relationship between Ruth and her mother, her mother who died when she was 17 years old and just about to go off to college. But I'll let you read the book, and you can, you can uh, enjoy her that had chapter. An amazing influence on her. But Jane, I just want to push you one more step, which is to say, in the book, you you know there are there's a a sort of sense of what a warm and generous person she was to so many people as she was to you when she was sort of opening up the task of of you know confronting a court or changing legislation if she had to. But you also say that she was a very ambitious woman, and you use that word several times to describe her. How do you reconcile the Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the ambitious woman who becomes a Supreme Court justice, with the warm, generous, and giving woman who she seems to be, especially in her early years as a teacher and as a, even as a litigator in her very early years? Well, I don't really think there's a, uh, 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 a conflict because when she was probably in the seventh or eighth grade, her mo well, first of all, her mother had great confidence in what women of valor could accomplish and what women should ac could accomplish. And she had all sorts of uh, role models, and Ruth read voraciously, and she was an extremely good student, and by the time she was, I think, probably eight or nine, she knew she wanted to do something, and she didn't know what, and she knew she was competitive which was good sense of self-awareness. Um, when she really decided she wanted to become a lawyer was when she was at Cornell, because it was midst of the feminist mystique and the height of McCarthyism. And she took a course under Nabokov, the author, who 
placed a great deal of emphasis on word choice, which she knew that she needed because she had, her father had his business had collapsed and her mother was dead. She knew that a, a BA in literature was not the ticket she needed. So she decided to take a, a course at Cornell in, to major in go the government. And she also, though she had a fellowship, she also had to uh, do work. She also had to work for various professors to earn more money. And she was taking a, a course with, uh, in constitutional law with two really significant professors who were critical to her thinking. Uh, one of them emphasized the importance of, two of the Cornell professors were investigated by the ACLU and he emphasized the importance of the lawyers who defended them. And the other professor, Milton Convitz, um, was a very erudite constitu uh, constitutional law professor who taught a course on American ideals. And one of his skills as a teacher was immersing students in, the, in not only the ideals of the Constitution, but the contemporary issues of the time, and for doing it in a way that, that made them realize how important those issues were and what they could do about them. And so she decided at the end, at the, in her sophomore year, that she wanted to become a lawyer because she had really learned about civil liberties. So take us into become, from becoming a lawyer to becoming an advocate on women's issues. How well, she never specialized in women's issues. Exactly. Her, her, her area of specialty was civil procedure and comparative civil, civil procedure. She had been to Sweden and, and uh, had written a book with a Swedish uh, jurist on um, civil procedure in Sweden. And then when the women's movement came along, she was asked by students to teach a course on women in the law. And so she started reading and also, she had become a full professor at that time, and she was taking on some ACLU clients in Newark, because she was teaching at the, at the um, Rutgers University Law School in Newark. And she decided she needed to read everything that was written about women in the law. And she could read all this, all everything that was available in a month. And she finished reading it, and she also read at that time, for the first time, Simone de Beauvoir's Second Sex. And it was like a light bulb went on. I can remember interviewing her one female colleague at Rutgers, and she said, Ruth just lit up even the men noticed it. <laughs> and uh, she decided that she could use her legal expertise to help achieve, to help end discrimination against women. And she had very little, little to work with because the only mention of women in the Constitution really is the 19th Amendment, which gives them the right to vote. So she, as she would say, there was an empty cupboard that she had to fill. And she certainly filled it well. <laughs> or, 
But uh, so th that's where I want to move you now, if you're willing to go there, which is to say, you know, so she she becomes an advocate for women, uh, and uh, she begins to imagine herself taking on some women's cases. Uh, and then she's offered a job at the ACLU Women's Rights Project. Well, well she, um, as I said, she was teaching at, at Newark. Rutgers Newark, at right. Rutgers and at Newark. And as a child, her uncle had a uh, camp for a boys and a boys camp and a girls camp in the Adirondacks, and. Um, as the older boys moved up in camp, some of them became waiters at the girls' camp. And it just so happened that the head of, of the ACLU uh, litigation, um, Mel Wolf, had been a waiter. I, I love that story in the book because she really got that job out of the old boys' network. It well, was really. She, the she um, she volunteered. She knew that the, he had. Um, she knew that the ACLU was interested in a test case to see if finally they could get the justices to do for women what it had done for African Americans, and uh, when. The constitutional lawyer at Rutgers, who was, uh, had said to, to uh, Wolf when he came down to talk to him, by the way, I understand you knew Kiki Bader. Kiki Bader, Kiki was Ruth's nickname because her older sister who died says, this is a baby, when Ruth was two, she said, this is a baby that kicks all the time. <laughs> which was a testament to her energy. And uh, so her nickname was Kiki. And Wolf had remembered this very vivacious camper Mel Wolf had. And so when he met her, he found this very restrained, reserved, suntan, uh, well-tanned woman who seemed completely different from this exuberant camper he had known, and to which I attribute learning the law on male turf. Because when she went to Harvard Law School, there were, uh, I think, 500 women. 500 students. 500 students. And nine women. Nine, and nine women. And one of the things that professors would like to do was have ladies' day. And I mean, they wouldn't call on women the other time. And they would have ladies' day. And if it involved a case of rape or anything like that, then they would call on them. And the women who were, at the time, because I've talked to several of them, said, well, we just thought that we didn't think of this as sexual harassment. We just thought they were tucking us up for whatever it took. Uh, but Ruth did not experience those. Uh, she didn't take those courses that had those professors. But she said there were so few of us that we stood out like a sore thumb, and we always knew we had to be prepared. So when, when she actually goes to work for the Women's Rights Project. She volunteers to write this test case. For, for Reed, Reed v. Reed. Reed, right. And the brief is brilliant. Right. And, they, and the court decides for the first time that there is such a thing as sex discrimination against women. But let's, let's talk about the law and how she helps to change it for a minute. So one of the things you emphasize is that she introduces this concept of sex discrimination when people, most people believed that it was just normal to treat women as lesser categories, less interested in work, and so on. 
So can you tell us how she develops this idea of sex discrimination in the law? Well, one of her predecessors, um, actually, two, there were two women who had been on the ACLU National Board, uh, Polly Murray, who was African American, and had it um, in law school, uh, had worked very closely with uh, lawyers who were fighting uh, segregation. And she had written an article called uh, Jane, Jane Crow, Crow in the Law. And uh, so Dorothy Kenyon was the other woman. Dorothy Kenyon was, had been a suffragist, actually, and was, um, and both of them had felt that there were possibilities there. And then in the 1960s, Pauli Murray uh, really worked very hard to convince the ACLU board that um, they needed to get, a bo to get on board, and they did. With actually the, the chair of the a National ACLU then was a Holocaust survivor, mm -hmm. and very, very young, and thought at the time that if they could do what they, if they had worked closely with the NAACP on the Civil Rights Project, then why not have a women's rights project? And, and once she'd got there, then the leap to equality was a very short step in a way. I mean, a long step legally or judicially, but still well, a she, short step in her imagination. Uh, she used uh, Thurgood Marshall as a model. <laughs> and uh, because he had, he had uh, used the Equal Protection Clause, the 14th Amendment, which was a Reconstruction Amendment designed to protect uh, former slaves who were facing re really re-enslavement of sorts. Uh, and it said that citizens of the United States cannot be denied uh, due process or equal protection. Now the problem, Marshall had an advantage because this was a Reconstruction Amendment and it was intended for African Americans. There was nothing that was intended for women. And so um, Ruth's strategy was to do what Marshall had done, which is take insignificant cases, establish a precedent, and then build on precedents till, in fact, you get to the Brown, Brown versus Board of Education. But um, it was a hurdle because justices at the time just assumed that women had it better than men. They didn't have to serve in the military. They didn't have to uh, serve on juries unless they wanted to. And um, the, the differences that people understood between men and women were just commonsensical. They didn't see them as stereotypes that could harm individual women or women as a group. And that was the big job of selecting cases that would enable her to illustrate that. One thing you do so brilliantly in the book and, and movingly is to show us case after case after case, interrogating each one of them until we get to the end of the 1970s and we see this panoply of cases which in some ways actually 
you know, places women in at a level of equality before the law that they've never had before, and which, as you say, might have played a role in undermining the Equal Rights Amendment. Well, actually, the Equal Rights Amendment, the struggle to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment was, was going on at the same time. And it was sort of a double-edged sword because initially, uh, justices, if they're going to change the law at all, need to be convinced that um, they're not doing this out of whole cloth, that uh, there are other branches of government that are on board. And Congress had passed the Equal Rights Amendment, and, it, and initially, states had rushed to ratify it very quickly, which, but then, so that initially it helped, but then it harmed, because when ratification slowed down, Ruth needed that sort of that as a, I wouldn't say as a club, but as an incentive. And as, uh, on the second case, her second case, There were, Justice Brennan thought he had enough votes to get the same level of scrutiny applied to gender that was applied to race. But he couldn't get the fifth vote because Justice Powell said, well, we can't do it until ERA is ratified. And so, uh, the justices in the middle uh, would not, would not, none of the justices in the middle would provide the, the fifth vote. Mm. And without that, as the 70s became more conservative, after all, Reagan won the election in 1980. Then there were other measures that I won't go into that made her convinced that she could not push the court any further. So women never got strict, or sex never got into the strict scrutiny category, no, which she, race she, was. She got as close as she could get when she was on the court in the uh, VMI case, it was a case involving a military, state-supported military school in Virginia that went back to pre-Civil War days. And the alumni were dead set against admitting women. But Jay, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'm gonna interrupt you because we don't have very much time left and I want to sort of move us into the, the uh, her years on the Supreme Court. And particularly, I want to ask two questions. The first of them is the following. So here's this uh, uh, new Supreme Court justice who is clearly not what we now call an originalist or a textualist, because after all, sex was not in the Constitution. As Scalia so, loved to remind, to remind her. her. Right, exactly. So how does she handle originalists or textualists on the Supreme Court? How, how does she deal with what's now the major division on the court? Well, um, I think it was uh, Kagan who said, we've all become textualists. Um, the interesting thing about um, originalism is the idea and Clarence Thomas um, and um, Scalia and Gorsuch uh, would claim to be uh, originalists. And that is that you have to interpret the Constitution as the Founding Fathers did, as, as opposed to seeing it as an evolving document that 
changes over time. But you can use this textualist method for progressive purposes. Uh, what the originalists tend not to do is pay much attention to the Reconstruction Amendments, which are absolutely critical. Uh, and so when the voting rights case came along, Ruth's, Ruth's arguments relied on textual analysis of the Reconstruction Amendments uh, having to do with, with voting. But her dissent is incredibly powerful uh, because, of course, the court tossed out the key provision of the Voting Rights Act. And, and her and she's learned to make her, her dissents um, much more readable and, to, and fill with, I mean, she knows she's not going to convince the conservatives on the court. So she writes more for the public and for posterity. And she has marvelous dissent that absolutely takes apart uh, just the Shelby decision. And she said that, in effect, that Justice Roberts' notion that you don't need the voting rights anymore because we've uh, gotten beyond that is like throwing away, throwing away your umbrella in the middle of a rainstorm. And these sorts of things go viral, and, I, and that's when the whole notion of the notorious RBG was devised by a law student at NYU who was just blown away by this dissent. Hmm. And Ruth didn't know anything about it until one of her clerks told her that it was a notorious RBG website. <laughs> yeah, it's wonderful. So let me ask you a final question before we open up to the audience. Um, so here's this woman who takes a seat, she's the second woman to take a seat on the Supreme Court, and she basically gets that seat because she's seen as a moderate. She's had a career as an appeals court judge, and the Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who is now known as no notorious, um, is not, is she the same Ruth Bader Ginsburg who was a moderate, or has the court around her changed? How, how, what's happened here that moves her from moderation? Well, she almost did not get the appointment on the uh, DC circuit because she was considered too liberal. So when she got on the uh, DC circuit, um, she developed a more moderate reputation. And um, she would argue now that she hasn't changed, but that the court has moved so far to the right. And Stephen, who was, uh, who was appointed by Ford as a Republican, would argue exactly the same thing uh, because he ended his career as a liberal uh, the head of the liberal wing of the court, and he would make exactly the same argument that he hasn't changed, but that the court has moved so far to the right with each successive justice. Okay, <laughs> I suppose that tells us something about the court, and oh, but you also learn a about... lot about the court, uh, <laughs> and it's it's it's. Quite interesting, I, I found. Good, thanks, Jane. And now, uh, are there any more questions? I should give up the floor and give up my monopoly and, and yeah.
Well, one difference is that the court had a swing justice. Uh, first, uh, Justice Powell, and then uh, Sandra Day O'Connor, and then Kennedy. The court is now without a swing justice in the center. Uh, how, but the justices, the justices do have lunch together every day when the court is in session. And what is interesting is what they're, what they're allowed to talk about. They never discuss cases. They talk about sp uh, sports, which Ruth is oblivious to. There's a wonderful story that one of her clerks, um, who's on the Harvard Law faculty now, told me um, about uh, Ginsburg and, and the sports world, which I will tell you, tell you later. Um, but Sotomayor, for example, is a great Yankees man. So the ones who are interested in sports talk about sports. They talk about culture, uh, cultural events, but there is no discussion. And I think a bit about family. Uh, but there is no discussion at all. Politics? Politics? No. No? I, it's hard to imagine you could have nine intelligent people in a room for lunch every day and they don't talk about politics? Well, not a... They're not allowed? Or they just... It's a tradition. It's a norm because they they have to live together and they have to, you know they have to work it, uh, together and they have they all shake hands before they go out on the uh you know after they uh, put on their robes and kagan i think when she was dean of harvard law school was very good at bridging differences. And Ruth is hugely polite. So, you know, I think, I think it will be very civil. And now, what she says in private with her clerks is another matter. <laughs> Let me repeat that question because it was quiet. How much do the clerks impact her ultimate decision? Well, she writes her own opinions and goes on this VMI um, decision, which in, which in a way was sort of completion of the things she had worked for as an ACLU litigator. And actually, Rehnquist, who was a classmate at, at Stanford Law School with O'Connor. And it's interesting because Sandra Day O'Connor, like Ruth, could not, she, when Chris graduated first in his class at Stanford Law School, Sandra Day O'Connor graduated third. And neither O'Connor or Ginsburg could get a job in a law firm. Um, I'm sorry, I lost track of the, the, the what question. Is, what impact did the clerks have oh, on her decision? Well, making? when she wrote the, the VMI opinion, you, you write opinions, you, she, was very, she relied on quotations from the other justices in cases to it's a way of roping them in. And she wrote 15 drafts of that opinion in order to, uh, she said she had an ending that she thought was perfect and Kennedy didn't like it. She didn't want to lose his vote, so she changed it. But she wrote, 50, uh, obviously clerks help and uh, she assigned a first draft to the, 
to one of her clerks who had been closely involved. But she rewrites everything. How does she choose her clerks? Like a family. One of the things that I think is fascinating is normally clerks, one goes to somebody like Larry Tribe at Harvard and say, whom would you recommend? And um, she gets their resumes and interviews them. And she said, I have one standard. It's how they treat the women in my chambers who are permanent members of the staff. And she said, if they are arrogant, I don't want them. If they're respectful to the women and my staff, then that's critical. But she's, they become a family. And she treated them, she treats her to, to clerks exactly the way she treat, uh, treated her assistants to the ACLU. She remembers birthdays uh, children's birthdays. Uh, when she's traveling, she brings them back little presents. I mean, they are an extended family. And when they're in Washington, um, she inquires, they see her again. She asks about their children and, um, and she is wonderful about, um, in terms of clerks, she, if they get the job done, when they do it, she herself works into the wee hours. It's a habit she developed um, when she was in law school because her husband had testicular cancer uh, and she would there were some nights when she didn't sleep at all because she had classmates take notes on back in the days of carbon paper for him and she would then type up his, his papers. Um, and she developed this ability to operate on minimal sleep. And so clerks attest to the fact that they get Calls on the, they have calls on their telephone from 3 and 4 and 5 o'clock in the morning. Uh, and then she sleeps on the weekend. But her, she, her clerks are really part of an extended family. If there are no more questions, let me ask you a final question, which is, so what about the future? Here we have all these issues on the table, labor, immigration, reproductive rights issues of all kinds. Can you give us a prediction of where and how Ruth might take the court? Well, it all depends on the rest of the court. I mean, she's the leader of the minority, which means that if, uh, for example, uh, let's say that Roberts, who would normally assign opinions, uh, decides that he's going to, that he's interested in preserving the integrity of the court, and he is going to vote with the minority. She then has the ability to either write the opinion or assign the opinion. And uh, so, she, and she's very good about assigning opinions to um, to people who will write effectively. But the, the last term was was not encouraging because only once did Robert. And in one case, Gorsuch and another vote with the minority. And on case after case after case, uh, 
they lost, as you, as you know, with, with public sector unions. They overturned a 40-year precedent. Yes. Que the she question hopes is, so too. Yeah. <laughs> the question is, how's her health? <laughs> well, it's a, a question that at the end of, particularly, you know, she had colon cancer and that she had, and uh, so when we would have an interview at the end, I would say, and what's the doctor's report? And she would give me a full briefing and, um, She, she's fragile. Uh, the last time I had an interview with her happened to be in Santa Fe. Uh, you know, if she's speaking at a podium on stage, she needs an arm to take when she steps down. But the push-ups she can do, her workout is phenomenal. Yeah. And uh, she says, you, you know, she, she was encouraged, strongly encouraged to resign, as was Breyer, back when there was a Democratic uh, Senate early on in, in Obama's term, uh, first term, and she said, you know, as long as I'll know when I'm unable to do the job. And she, she loves it. I mean, she'd rather win than lose constantly, but she yeah. really loves the job. And I, I ask her, um, how do you think you've changed on the court? And she said, I have much more confidence in my judgment. <laughs> So I don't see her walking away until a health crisis really uh, affects her significantly. And we know what she thinks of Trump because of her indiscreet remark during the campaign. That's a wonderful note to wrap up on. So let's say thank you to Jane for producing this wonderful book. <laughs>